Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati and what we were discussing, we were discussing about the different properties of the enzyme and in this context, uh, in the current module, we are discussing about how you can be able to purify the uh, overexpressed protein or enzyme in a particular cell and in this context, so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the uh, disruption of the uh, host cells so that you can be able to release the enzymes into the solution and subsequent to that we have also discussed about the uh, you know the ion exchange chromatography and as well as the hydrophobic interaction chromatic chromatography so that you can be able to use them for the protein production now since the enzyme is providing the various types of opportunities, right? You can, as you can see, that we have discussed about that the enzymes are also having the uh, surface, you know, the uh, so surface area. So that surface area also can be utilized for the uh, separation of the proteins, and as well as the enzymes are having the exclusive features, and that can also be exploited into the affinity chromatography. So in today's lecture, we are going to discuss about the how you can be able to exploit the surface area of a protein uh, in terms of the, the gel filtration chromatography and how you can be able to use the affinity chromatography to purify the proteins. So, so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the ion exchange chromatography which is actually going to exploit the presence of the charge onto the protein structures and then we also discussed how the hydrophobic patches what are present on the protein can be exploited in the, gel fit, in the hydrophobic interaction chromatography. Now in today's lecture, we are going to start the discussion about the gel filtration chromatography. Now, before we discuss about the gel filtration chromatography, we have to discuss or we have to understand about the protein folding process. So, you know that the proteins are actually going to be produced from the ribosome. So, you can imagine that we have a ribosome on this side and from this side, the protein chain is going to come out. So, it is actually going to be formed in, in it's come out in the form of the peptide chain and uh, once the peptide uh, chain is going to come out from the ribosome, it is going to be get folded according to the interaction between the different types of amino acids and um, based on these molecular interactions, the amino acids are first going to be partially folded and then this partially folded protein is actually going to acquire the additional interactions and that is how it is actually going to be completely folded. And what you see is in this particular folded protein that it has arranged the hydrophobic residues in the center of the protein and as well as the hydrophobic residues outside okay so if you see this protein from the top right what you will see is that around a particular center the amino acids are being arranged and that's how it is actually all the globular proteins are actually going to form the balls of the different sizes and, uh, in, and, and, and in each ball, what you will see is that the hydrophobic core is going to be present in the center. So this is actually the hydrophobic core, uh, hydrophobic core, which is surrounded by the hydrophilic molecules. Okay. Uh, and as I said, you know, the, when you are actually having the gel filtration, when you are going to see the arrangement of the amino acid around a particular center, the proteins are actually going to form the balls of the different diameters or uh, the uh, Rg values. 
So if I show you how the sizes are actually going to vary, so I have taken the examples of the different protein sizes. So I have taken the examples of 5 kDa molecule, 15 kDa, 35 kDa, 65 kDa, 95 kDa. So these are the molecular weight I have taken. Now what you see here is that these are the number of residues. So in a 5 kDa protein, you can have the 45 residues. In 15 kDa, you have the uh, 135 residues in uh, 35 kDa you have 315 residues, 55 kDa 585 and for 95 it is going to be 855 residues which means these many number of amino acids. Now what you see is that the uh, radius of uh, radius of these uh, um, proteins or these balls are 2.45 nanometer in the case of the 5 kDa proteins. 3.53 in the case of the 15 kDa proteins and 4.69 nanometers in the case of the 35 kDa and 5.77 and as well as 6.54 in the case of the 65 and 95 kDa respectively. What you see in this and all these calculations are being based on the tool what you can use to calculate the size of a protein. So if, if you see if you put the amino acid sequence in this particular tool or if you put the molecular weight of that protein, it is actually going to give you the sizes of the protein, which means it is actually going to give you the uh, size of that particular ball, okay. So what you see is that it is not proportional, it is not like 5 kDa versus 15 kDa, so size is actually going to be 3 times, so it is not 3 times, but it will definitely going to be increased in a particular ratio, okay. And that is how you can actually be able to exploit this feature in a, in a chromatography which is called as the gel filtration chromatography because as the size will go up it is actually going to increase the hydrodynamic uh, volume and that actually is going to be uh, exploited because this ball is going to be very different from this ball so it they can be actually be separated with the help of the gel filtration chromatography. How gel filtration chromatography is going to separate a small ball from the large ball is because it is going to have the sieving effect. So what is sieving effect? Sieving effect is that you are going to have the beads which are actually going to have the pores and you can have the large pores or you can actually have the small pores. So when the molecules are going to be loaded onto the column, what will happen is that either they will enter into the pore or they are actually going to be excluded from the pore. So uh, exclusion of the large size molecule and inclusion of the small molecule uh, molecules from the pore is actually going to be a result into the separation of these molecules onto the with the help of the sieving effect, which means it is actually going to filter out the molecules in a reverse orientations. Mostly when you do the sieving, it is actually going to retain the large molecule and it is going to filter out the small molecule. But here you are going to have the reverse sieving effect where it is actually going to exclude the large molecule but it is actually going to retain the small molecules. Now what you see here is that in a gel filtration chromatography column what we have done is we have various type of molecules. So we have a big molecule and a small molecules. And uh, so this is the big molecule and this is the middle size molecule and this is the small size molecule. Okay. And what we have done is we have loaded a column and we have prepared a column and then we have loaded all these three molecules. So what will happen is that all these three molecules are actually going to compete for the pores what is present in these beads. And as a result, they are actually going to be get distributed. And as I said, you know, large molecules are going to be excluded from the column, whereas the middle sized molecules are going to be separated from the small molecules. So what you see here is that in this particular region, the small molecules are sitting, whereas the large molecules are sitting in this region and the large and the, and the largest molecules are sitting in this. So as a result, what will happen is that the largest molecules are actually going to be eluted first the middle sized molecules are going to be eluted second and the very small molecules are going to be separated last. And this is actually the principle of gel filtration chromatography that it is actually going to distribute the molecule based on their sizes and as a result of that uh, it is going to first elute the large molecules then it is actually going to elute the small molecules. The column 
is packed with a bleach containing pores to allow entry of the molecule based on their sizes. The smallest size is the inner part of the pore followed by the gradual increasing size and large molecule excluded from entering into the gel. The separation between the molecule occur due to the time they travel to come out from the pores. When the mobile phase passes through the column, it takes protein along with it. The small molecules present in the inner part of the gel takes longer flow of liquid and travel longer path to come out whereas the larger molecules travel less distance to come out. As a result, the large molecule and small molecule get separated from each other. To understand this better, uh, we have I, hold, I am going to show you a bead, how the bead is look like. So in a small uh, bead, uh, you what you have is you are actually going to have the pores like this. So these are the pores on the gel filtration beads. These pores can be different types. So you can actually be able to have the flexibility of choosing the uh, you know the beads of the different sizes. So what will happen is that in this pore, the small size particles are actually going to sit at the bottom of this bead. Okay, the small. This is the small size, right? And the middle size particles are going to sit in the middle of this particular beads, right? So it's, they are going to sit in the middle of this, and whereas the large particles are actually going to be excluded, or they will be sitting at the bot at the top of this particular beads. Okay, so they are going to sit on top of this. So what happens is that when you are loading a mixture, the mixture is actually competing with each other to getting filled into these funnels. Okay. So it, it the first you so you have the multiple rows, right? For example, you have one row, second row, third row, fourth row, fifth row, sixth, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. So you have thirteen row of beads. So what happen is in the first row of the beads, all the molecules are actually going to compete. So you have three molecules. You have the large molecules. You have the uh, middle size molecules and you also have the small size molecules. Now when these three molecules are competing with each other, they are actually, you know, they, they should run fast, right? And you know that the small size molecule is very small. So it is actually, and it also lighter in terms of the particle. So it's actually the dynamics of this molecule is going to be very fast right so it's actually going to run very fast right so it's like that that if you want to enter into a cinema hall to capture the seats in your room right the smallest size part um, boy is actually going to enter and it will actually going to run very fast and that's how he's actually going to be able to capture the seats uh, in the first row okay so this is what exactly going to happen. In the first guy, the smallest guy is actually going to go and capture the initial rows, right? And that's how it is actually going to fill into this particular inner part of the uh, cavity, okay? So you can imagine that if I have this, the inner part of the cavity, the smallest particle is going to sit. Now, by the time these middle size particle and the large size particle are actually going to try to sit in the same uh, funnel or same bead, they are actually going to push out, okay? And that's how they will actually going to sit in the uh, layer number 3, 4 or 5. So in this layer, the middle size particle, because now the smaller size particles are already been exhausted. So what will happen is that the middle size particles are actually going to sit and in the 3, 4, 5, right? Similarly, in the 6 and 7, you are going to have the large size particle which is actually going to sit at the top of this particular bead. So now you what you have is you have the large size particle sitting here, middle size particle sitting here and the small size particle sitting in the top blue layers. Okay. Now what will happen is the amount of the uh, the, the length what they, these molecules are going to run. So for the large one, it is actually going to run this. So this is for the VL which is for the large size particle. For the middle one, it is actually has to run this much, right? So it is actually going to be the VM or middle one, uh, illusion volume for the middle one. And for the smallest one, it, it has to run all the way from here to here. This means, uh, and this is going to be the small one, okay? So this means, so VS is actually going to be bigger than VM and VM is going to be bigger than, uh, bigger than the 
uh, VL. This means this is going to be the smallest, this is going to be the middle size, and this is going to be the smallest one. Which means if I look, if I show you how they will be getting eluted onto the chromatogram, it will be like this. So VL, you remember that the VL is the smallest. So this means the VL is actually going to be eluted first. Uh, middle size, the VM is actually going to be middle size, so it is actually going to be eluted second and the small one is actually going to have to travel from all the way from here to here and that's why it is actually going to take the uh, uh, largest uh, distance, right? So it has to be largest, so it has going to be the last particle which is going to be come out from the part, from the column. Using these uh, informations, you can be able to calculate the distribution coefficient. So, for the calculating of distribution coefficient, what you have to do is you have to uh, you have to determine the some of the parameters. For example, you have to determine the Vt, which is the total volume of the gel. Then you also have to calculate the uh, wide volume, and you also have to calculate the elution volume. And utilizing these informations, you can be able to calculate the KD values, which is actually the VE minus VO divided by VI. And uh, using these information, you can be able to calculate the distribution coefficient. Okay. Many times the students get confused between the KD, what we we use normally for as a unit for the molecular weight of the protein versus the coefficient, right? So it's actually a coefficient, uh, the distribution coefficient. Okay. Uh, in the case of the uh, you know, in, in the case of the uh, KDA for the protein, it's always been small k followed by the capital D and A, whereas in this case, it's actually KD. So, this is different from the uh, KDA what you are using for the protein uh, for the protein molecular weight. Uh, so, VG is the total volume of the gel, VI is the pore volume and VO is the word volume. So, volume of mobile phase flow to elute a column from a column is known as elution volume. The elution volume is related to the void volume and the distribution coefficient as the VE is VO plus KD VI. So using this, you can be able to calculate the uh, distribution coefficients and depending on the distribution coefficient, uh, the molecules could be of, the analytes could be of three types. Either you can have the KD is equal to zero, so this means the KD is equal to zero, right? If the KD is equal to zero, which means V E minus V O is actually going to be also zero, right? So these uh, and this means the V E is actually equal to V O, right? This means the V E is actual V O and these analytes will be completely excluded from the column, which means if the K D is zero, the V E is equal to V O and these analytes will be completely excluded from the column. Similarly, if you have the KD is equal to 1, this means the VE is equal to VO plus VI and these analytes will be completely in the pore of the column, which means these are the smallest uh, molecules or smallest analyte, which you can be able to analyze in this particular column. And now if you have the KD which is above to 1, in this situation, the analyte will absorb onto the column matrix. Now, uh, you can use the different types of matrix for the gel filtration chromatography, right? So, the choice of the column matrix depends on the range of the molecular weight and the pressure limit of the operating equipment. A list of the popular filtration is, uh, is given in the table, okay? So, you have the uh, gel column matrix and you also have the fractionation range. So, for example, G10, the fractionation range is 0 to 700 Daltons. Then you have G25, which has a fractionation range between the 1000 to 5000 and so on. And uh, you can actually be able to use uh, the, the fractionation range as a criteria to choose the matrix of your choice. Now, if uh, I have to run a gel filtration chromatography, I have to pack the column, right? So, column packing is uh, where you are actually going to, uh, you have to do a lot of precautions. Uh, so, first is you have to first prepare the column material. So, you are going to take the powder, you have to dissolve it into the buffer of your choice where you are planning to uh, pack the column. And then the column material is allowed to swell in the mobile force. It is poured into the glass tube and allow the beads to settle without trapping the air bubble within the column. 
you have to always consider two parameters one is the flow rate at which you are going to pack the column so the simple formula for packing the flow rate is that you are going to have two flow rates one is the packing flow rates and the other one is called as the running flow rate okay this means this is the this is the flow rate on which you are actually going to run the column right so the so form the general understanding is that the packing flow rate is going to be five times to the uh, running flow rate okay so this means if i am packing a column at 5 ml per minute uh, i cannot run this column more than 1 ml per minute because if you run it for more than that it is actually going to disturb the packing of the column and then you also have to see the back pressure so back pressure also should be compatible with the uh, protein purification system what you are using uh and uh, we have prepared a small uh, demo clip so that you can be able to use and understand how you can be able to pack a column and how you can be able to run the gel filtration chromatography uh so um, once you pack the column you also have to do a quality checking right so the column material is allowed to swell in the mobile phase it is poured into the glass tube and allow the beads to settle down without trapping the air bubble within the column once the matrix is settled down in column it can be tested for the presence of air channels and well packing by follow a uh, analyte with a kd is equal to 1 it is expected that the elution volume in this case should be ve plus vo which means it is going to be on the inner part of the inner part of the pores right so uh um, what can be the smallest molecule so what people do is they always try to uh, analyze the acetone okay so acetone is not uh, is is miscible in the water but it can be detected by taking an absorbance at 220 nanometer so you can actually be able to know when the acetone is coming out from the column so if you analyze the acetone it is actually going to take the uh, uh, its elution volume is equal to the vo plus uh, Uh, vi okay this means it's actually going to give you it will if it is less than that right if the elution volume is different from this value then you will say that there is a air air bubbles or there are air channels which are actually being utilized by the acetone to travel faster and that's how it is actually going to tell you that whether the column packing is good or not uh there are so many troubleshooting what you can do with the gel filtration chromatography uh, you can actually be able to do the back pressure you can see the clogging and you also have to see the precipitation so back pressure is very important that you should not have uh, you know build the back pressure into the gel filtration column because otherwise it is actually going to disturb the packing of the column uh and uh, clogging is also very important because when sometimes what you do is when you don't filter the proteins and you load it onto the column it is actually going to clog the column and then it's actually going to have a problem in terms of providing the back pressure and also the running of the column and uh, there are so many things what you can do if you want to avoid that you can actually filter the your sample and then you only you inject and in some time what happen is that there the protein is actually getting precipitated right so protein is in solution but when you load this protein onto the column it get precipitated so precipitated protein is actually going to be eluted and it's going to be you know it's going to be contaminate your column so in those cases you have to either you have two choices either you wash the column with a uh, harsh Uh, you know high salt concentration uh, protein as uh, a high salt concentration buffer or urea containing buffer so that the precipitated protein is going to be removed or you have to dislodge the column wash the beads and then you can use the beads for uh, for deep repackings so um, how you can run the gel filtration chromatography so you can actually first have to prepare the sample the sample is prepared so you first you have to pack the column right and in the step 2 you are going to prepare the sample so sample is prepared in the mobile phase and should be free of suspended particle to avoid the clogging of the column the most recommended method to apply the sample is to inject the sample with a syringe then what you have to do is you have to do the elution so in gel filtration no gradient of salt is used to elute the sample from the column the flow of mobile phase is used to elute the molecules from the column and then once the col uh, gel filtration is over you can actually be able to do the column regeneration so after the analysis of the analyte 
The gel filtration column is washed with a salt containing mobile phase to remove the all non specifically absorbed protein into the matrix. The column is uh, then equilibrated with the mobile phase to generate the column, right? Uh, regenerate the column. The column can be stored at 4 degree in the presence of 20 percent alcohol containing 0 0.05 percent sodium azide. You know that sodium azide is bactericidal, so it actually will not allow the bacteria to grow because most of these columns are made up of, of the uh, sugary beets, right? They are made up of the cephadex or agarose, and agarose is nothing but a sugar, so they are very susceptible for the damage. Uh, so, we are actually uh, prepared a very small demo clip and uh, in this demo clip what we have done is we are actually going to explain you how you can be able to pack the column, how you can be able to uh, you know test the quality checking and all that and then how you can be able to resolve the proteins and determine the uh, KD values and all that. So, uh, in this demo the students have actually uh, uh, shown you all these operations of the gel filtration chromatography. Hi everyone, myself Suram Banesh, research scholar at Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering at IIT Gauhati. In this video, we will demonstrate how to perform gel filtration chromatography or size exclusion chromatography. There are various methods are available in chromatography to separate different types of biomolecules. For example, if you want to separate based on size or shape, it is called as gel filtration chromatography which suits the most. If you want to separate the molecules based on their charge, then you can go for the uh, ion exchange chromatography. So uh, these are uh, various methods are available. But in this video, we are mainly focusing on the gel filtration or size exclusion chromatography. What is uh, gel filtration chromatography. There is two phases in this process. One is stationary phase, another one is uh, mobile phase. Stationary phase mainly a matrix, cross liquid matrix. For example, we can use uh, dextran or uh, another name of dextran is uh, sephadex. This is highly cross liquid uh, glucose molecules or we can use agarose, this is also cross liquid or we can use polyacrylamides. But in this video, we are showing Sephardix G75, this is the stationary phase we are using. So in this matrix, it contains beads which having small pores. So if you want to separate a mixture of molecules starting from uh, 1 KDA to suppose uh, uh, 200 KDA. So, the small molecule which is 1 KDA, it will permeate through or diffuse into the pores in the beads and the bigger molecule having a 200 KDA, it will exclude it from the retaining in the, that uh, portion of uh, pores. So, it will elude first and the smaller molecule will retain there and we have to give uh, sufficient buffer to elude that one. So this is the overall concept of the gel filtration chromatography. It can be widely used as uh, used in uh, separation of uh, proteins, peptides or uh, oligonucleotides. So in this video we will show you how to pack the column first and what are the buffers required and how to uh, we will demonstrate eluting two different molecules. One is uh, larger size and another one is the smaller size. So let's start the packing. So we can use for this chromatography a buret or a column. So this is a one of the column uh, we are using we are using in this experiment. So uh, the resolution of the molecules, if you are using 10 KDA protein, 20, 30, 40, 50, in this case, you need to increase the length of the column that will improve the resolution of the molecules. Otherwise, if you are using a small like uh, this much length, then the resolution is improper. You can get uh, you know, one fraction, another protein you will get. So uh, here we are using this, it is sufficient to 
element one small uh, size and another one large size molecules. So before using that, there is no uh, no support on the bottom of the column. So there is a direct contact. If we open this one, then completely whatever the solution or beads are there, it will flow through. So for to prevent this one, what we have to do is we have to block this area with the cotton, a small piece of clean cotton. So I am going to first uh, uh, put some cotton in the bottom of this one. Then we will uh, load the beads. So now we block the bottom region. Now we have to load the beads. Uh, beads preparation is very simple. This is the packet. Completely pour into a 500 ml of water. So the beads will sold and give the uh, at least 100 percent uh, swelling. So this is uh, already overnight swollen uh, beads. So we can use it directly. We need not to wait for. Uh, another uh, 24 hours so so i'm going to keep this one so before loading the beads i'm going to wash the column properly so that uh, there is no other particles will present inside the column and also uh, to soak the cotton which are, uh, we inserted uh, in this. Uh, now we wash the column uh, properly. So the cotton also, the bottom one uh, cotton also soaked properly. So the next thing is we have to uh, add buffer, equilibrate the column. So generally in all gel filtration experiments, we will use 0 0.05 molar sodium phosphate buffer. Uh, so this is already prepared sodium phosphate buffer, pH uh, 7.4. So I'll just I will add as this. Once the soaking in uh, the sodium phosphate buffer is over, we have to keep uh, at least uh, one fourth of buffer uh, in column itself. Then we will load the beads. You cannot load complete beads directly because it may disturb the column packing. So we will ask, uh, we will load the beads and uh, let it set in. Uh, by influence of gravity. So, these are the beads. Just I am going to add the beads. So, while the settling is going on, you can uh, open the column. The flow should be uh, less, otherwise uh, the diameter of the this uh, opening uh, outlet is very high. So uh, completely it will come down. So it will it will give cracks in the column pattern. So we are uh, releasing the buffer very slowly.
beads are settling as we can see the, the beads are settling properly on the bottom of the column now as you can see we back the column properly so uh, now we have to the next step is we have to load the sample before loading the sample we have to remember that we cannot directly load the sample as it will uh, uh, disturb the column packing so what we have to do is we have to put a small piece of paper on top of the beads so on top of that we can uh, load our sample so i am going to keep this one So next step is we have to load the sample. So here loading sample, it is a better practice to load with the beads rather than sample alone. So what I am going to do is this is our sample which contains one is 2000 KDA blue dextra. Uh, this is one of the glucose poly. This is a polysaccharide and other molecule is one of the colored compound uh, which is uh, 0.5 kda so uh, by principle uh, blue dextran eludes first which contains blue color and the small molecule it eludes later onwards so we will load the sample i will add the beads to the sample And this sample I am going to load on top of. No, now let this settle then we will uh, keep replenishing with the uh, phosphate buffer so what happens uh, the blue colored compound it eludes first and the yellow one it uh, uh, stays some time retained by the uh, particulate gaps then it will lend upon uh, addition of extra buffer Uh, as we can see we have loaded two components one is the high molecular weight blue dextran another one is the fluorescein which is low molecular weight so as we can see blue dextran this uh, corresponding to uh, blue dextran so it is eluting fast uh, comparing to the fluorescein which is uh, yellow in color uh, orange in color so uh, you have to elute it completely by using the buffer when uh, the buffer is comes to here comes to an end you have to replenish with the buffer and uh, you have to collect the fractions as you can clearly see this uh, 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 blue dextran band it is eluting out so you have to collect this and uh, check for purity suppose if you are uh, separating uh, uh, three different proteins one is 70 kda another one is the 100 kda another one is the uh, 300 kda so according to this uh, principle of gel filtration chromatography and their size and shape 300 kda protein eludes first you have to collect the fractions uh, from uh, initial fractions that gives you 300 kda protein and uh, 100 kda comes later and uh, at last 70 kda protein eludes but after collecting how do you know these proteins are uh, uh, their corresponding molecular weights so what you have to do is you have to collect all the fractions and uh, you can verify through uh, polyacrylamine gel electrophoresis or you can check uh, the uv visible spectrometer uh, and uh, based on the uh, 
the protein absorption spectra. So we can clearly see it is a routing count. Uh, with this, uh, we understand that gel filtration chromatography is a uh, very advantageous technique for separation of proteins, peptides and uh, oligonucleotides. And also, uh, during this uh, experiment, we have to remember few more points and follow the caches. The buffer uh, need to be prepared, and uh, it is uh, uh, it should not it be it will be free from the uh, any air bubbles. So we can prepare the buffer and keep it in uh, ultrasonic bath. So it will which will remove the uh, remaining air bubbles. While packing up the column also ensure that there is no air bubbles in between the beads that will uh, decrease the efficiency of the separation or resolution of the proteins. And also one more thing, while uh, packing the column, you should not directly add the beads, you just have to uh, keep some of the buffer and then add the buffers. Uh, and also once the uh, separation is over, you have to wash, with, wash the column with sufficient amount of uh, buffer and water and also 0.2 normal sodium hydroxide to remove any uh, suspended particles or uh, uh, any proteins. So after that you can store it in the 20% ethanol uh, for further use. You can use as many times as you want uh, till uh, the beads are uh, beads, um, retain the activity. So uh, this is the this is all about the gel filtration chromatography. This is not only manually uh, or gravity based one. You can also use it in the different instruments like uh, 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 pro FELC uh, um, or uh, protein other protein purification systems. So. Uh, this is all about the uh, gel filtration chromatography. Thanks for watching. So uh, this is the gel filtration column attached to protein purification system. So here what we will show you, uh, we will inject the blue dust and BSA and show, the, show their pattern, how they are healthy. This blue dust gives a wide volume of the column and also BSA gives actual uh, elution pattern. So if you run few more proteins with known molecular weight, we will get the uh, calibration curve with that we can calculate unknown proteins molecular weight. So this column is equilibrated as we can see here. Uh, when we introduce it into buffer, uh, after removing 20% ethanol, and uh, water also so we can see this is this one corresponds to blue line corresponds to uh, uh, 218 nanometer which is uh, relevant to protein one so we can see we have there is a initial spike but uh, gradually it the line uh, the curve flat flattened so that means uh, there is no contaminants and now the column is ready to inject the protein. So what we will do, we will inject the protein and we will show how to inject protein also. Then we will the, uh, show the pattern where they are eluting. So here, we will end the program. So we will start the new program. System flow will keep Point five ml per minute. Insert. Flow path. Column position at one. And downward flow. Insert. Monitors. We need three different uh, wavelengths. Two fifteen for uh, peptide bond. Two fifty four for nucleic acid and 280 for aromatic amino acids and uh, we have to set the alarms also 
uh, we'll set this 3 and this one 0 1 complete system pressure 3 and this one 0 1 so we will inject the protein now then we will see how it is this is the port where we are going to inject the uh, uh, sample so once we will inject this one and uh, execute inject so this is the pattern of uh, injected uh, components this one corresponds to the uh, blue dextran and it gives the wide volume uh, of 8 ml uh, as we can see here it corresponds to 8 ml so there is no proper resolution between uh, bsa and the blue dextran this corresponds to 8 ml which is blue dextran and this one is the 9.2 to 9.5 this corresponds to the uh, uh, BSA. So once this is finished, we have to run another one column of in buffer to remove any uh, other proteins. And after that, we will uh, keep it in uh, keep it in water. So to remove any uh, kind of salts if present then we will keep it the 20% thickener uh, we will run at least uh, one column value so that that directly we can use to preserve the column after that we have to purge with the 20% thickener complete system so that uh, there is no uh, contamination or bacterial growth uh, if you left for few days also so this is all about uh, uh, gel filtration chromatography so we will show you how to analyze the result so once the gel filtration run is over we have to analyze the results so this is the software we will use for the uh, evaluation purpose so we have to open the, uh, the chromatogram which you want to analyze so we already opened this is the chromatogram we run recently so we have to analyze uh, peaks so peak integrate option is there so just say uh, which one you want to analyze uh, uv 280 nanometer one or 215 we have all only 281 so that's let's say analyze so as we can see it gave uh, the retention volumes of the peaks and also the area and the height of the peak these values can be used for constructing calibration curve this one belongs to blue dextran and this one is uh, for bs so uh, in a summary, in this video we showed how to uh, run a gel filtration, we showed manually how to pack the column with the beads and also connecting through instrument. So hope this will help uh, for your research to improve your research. Thanks for watching. So this is all about the gel filtration chromatography uh, where we have discussed about the many properties of the we have discussed about the principle of the technique and then we also have discussed about the how you can be able to exploit the technique for purification of the proteins and uh, how you can be able to perform the gel filtration chromatography. Now once we are done with gel filtration chromography we can go to the next chromatography technique which is based on the exclusive features 
what is present onto the column and this is called as the affinity chromatography. Affinity chromatography, as the name suggests, the affinity chromatography is works on the principle of mutual recognition forces between a ligand and the receptor. The major determinants responsible to provide the SFT are shape complementarity, electrostatic, hydrogen bonding and vulnerable interaction between the group which are present onto the ligand receptor pair. So you can imagine that I have a ligand receptor, right? so this is the receptor and this is the ligand. Now these ligand receptors are getting recognized by the multiple interactions and multiple criteria. First the criteria is that the ligand should be three dimensionally compatible with the uh, receptor. Okay, So if the receptor has the cavity like this, the ligand is also should have the complementity. So the first th thing what you are going to have is you are going to have the geometric, geometric complementity. Okay? which means the 3D structure should match, which means this notch is going to fit into this groove. Now, apart from that, it also should have the stereoselectivity, okay? uh, which means the, uh, the, uh, the ligand should be of stereoselective so that it should have the made up of the L amino acids and uh, the receptor also should recognize the uh, ligands made up of the L amino acids. Then the third is the molecular interactions. So within the molecular interactions, uh, you can imagine that the interaction what are present on the ligand should be compatible with the receptor. For example, you have the positive charge on this, then it should have the negative charge onto the ligand. And it, this should be at the same point. So when this ligand will go and fit into this particular receptor, this positive is actually going to interact with the negative and that's how it is actually going to have the salt bridge interactions. Similarly, uh, you can have the uh, hydrogen uh, donor and acceptor. So it could be that you, you the receptor has the hydrogen donor. So uh, the, the ligand should have the hydrogen acceptor and that's how they should actually have a hydrogen bonding. Similarly, you can have the you know groups which are actually going to be involved in the wonder wall interactions and you can also have the hydrophobic um, residues which are actually going to be interact with the hydrophobic residues present on the receptor with the pi pi interaction. So these interactions are very important to hold the, hold the receptor and the ligand for the fruitful outcomes. So in a mutual interaction between the ligand and receptor to form ligand receptor complex, the dissociation constant, the KD, which is expressed as KD is uh, RL by RL, right? So R plus L is forming a reversible uh, complex with the uh, receptor and that's how it is actually going to give you a complex of RL and you can be able to use this equation to calculate the dissociation constant. And this is actually the basic principle of the affinity chromatography. So what happened in the affinity chromatography is that when a crude mixture is passed through an affinity column, the receptor present on the matrix react with the ligand present on the different molecules. Right? The mutual collision between the receptor on the matrix and the ligand on different molecules tests the affinity between them and consequently the best choice binds to the receptor whereas all other molecules do not bind and appear in a flow through. A wash step removes the remaining weakly bound molecules on the matrix. Subsequently, a counter ligand is used to elude the bound molecule through a competition between the matrix bound molecule and a counter ligands. Which is what exactly happened, right? In a, in a chromatic chromatography, what you have is you have an immobilized ligand what is present on the matrix. And when it reacts with the free enzyme, it actually reacts with many types of ligand. This free enzyme is actually go and bind to this particular ligand. And that's how it is actually going to form the uh, enzyme ligand complex. Now, at this stage, you can have the multiple options. Either you use the competitor, right? You can put the similar kind of uh, ligands and that's how it is actually going to destroy. It's actually going to compete for the enzyme bound, enzyme which is bound to the matrix versus the free ligand. And that's how it is, the enzyme will go and bind to the free ligand. And that's how it is actually going to be removed. Uh, so the, the option is that you can actually do the non-specific elution where you can change the pH or the ionic strength and that's how it is actually going to break the interaction between the uh, matrix bound ligand to the enzyme and that's how it is actually going to uh, you know elute out the purified enzyme. What are the advantages of the gel filtration, uh, the affinity chromatography? So what are the advantages of the affinity chromatography? First is specificity. 
FDT chromatography is specific to the analyte in comparison to the other purification techniques which are utilizing the molecular size, charge, hydrophobic patches or the isolectic point. Then the second point is the purification yield. Compared to the other purification method, the FDT purification gets very high level of purification gold with the high yield. In a typical purification, FDT purification more than 90% recovery is possible. So this is the conventional chromatography. So if you started with the 100 milligrams of protein, it could be possible that after the first uh, you know, purification, you can actually have the uh, 10 milligrams in one fraction, 25 milligrams in third fraction, 45 milligram is what your protein is, and the 15 milligram what is going to be in the fourth column. Similarly, in the case of FNT chromatography, what will happen is that it's going to have the 10 milligram of wastage in the first column, first fraction, the 5 milligram in the second fraction and more than 85 percent is going to be in the your purified fraction. So, that is how your recovery is going to be very high compared to the uh, compared to the conventional chromatography because conventional chromatography relies on the basic properties rather than uh, phonetic chromatography is uh, rely on the uh, exclusive properties. Then the third is reproducible. Affinity purification is reproducible and it gives the consistent result from one purification to other as long as it is independent to the presence of contaminating species. Then it is easy to perform. Affinity chromatography is a very robust and it depends on the force governing the ligand receptor complex formation. Compared to the other technique, no column packing, no special purification system and sample preparation required for the affinity chromatography. And uh, so this is very, very important because it actually saves your time for uh, training a manpower and that's how anybody can be able to do affinity chromatography without much training. Now, once we are talking about, as we are talking about the different types of affinity chromatography, did you, so you can have the bio affinity chromatography. So in a bio affinity chromatography, in this type of affinity chromatography, Biomolecules are used as a receptor present on the matrix and it exploits the biological affinity phenomena such as antibody antigen. In addition, the enzyme substrate or the enzyme inhibitor is also belong to this class, for example, the GST and glutathione. So, in the bioaffinity chromatography, you are exploiting the already existing, uh, you know, the pairs in the biological system. So, that you can actually be able to use. And in a, every biological system, I, you are going to have the receptor and you are going to have the ligand. So, either of these you can actually be able to couple to the matrix and uh, the ligand you can actually be able to couple to the protein of your interest and that is how you can be able to exploit this for inter, uh, purifying the uh, your protein of your interest. Uh, there are examples like the enzyme substrate or enzyme inhibitor like the GST and glutathione, whereas antigen antibody is also uh, an example of the bioaffinity chromatography. Then you have the pseudo affinity uh, chromatography. So, in this affinity chromatography, a non biological molecule is used as a receptor on the matrix to exploit the separation and the purification of the biomolecules. There are two specific examples. You can have the di affinity chromatography. So, in this method, the matrix is coupled to the reactive dye and the matrix bound dye has a specificity towards a particular enzyme. For example, the sebagron blue. F3GA dye coupled to the dextran matrix has a very strong affinity for the dehydrogenases. Similarly, you can have the metal affinity chromatography. So, in this method, the transition metals such as the iron, nickel or zinc is coupled to the matrix and matrix bound metal form the multi-dentate complex with the protein containing polyhistidine. Tag. The affinity of the protein for matrix bound metal is different and these differences are being exploited in metal affinity chromatography to purify the proteins. Apart from these two uh, categories, you can also have the covalent chromatography. Uh, in a covalent chromatography, what you have is that uh, where the analyte is permanently actually go and bind to the matrix. So, it is not reversible. Majority of the affinity chromatography or all other chromatography techniques are reversible, but this is a different kind of chromatography where binding of the analyte to the matrix is not reversible as it involves the formation of a covalent bond between the functional group present on the matrix and the analyte. So, the thiol group which are present on the neighboring residue of protein forms a disulfide bond after oxidation and under reducing environment disulfide reversible brokerage back to the free thiol. 
The matrix in the covalent chromatography has immobilized thiol group which forms a covalent linkage with the free thiol groups containing protein present in the matrix. After a washing step to remove the non-specifically bound protein, a mobile phase containing compound with reducing thiol group is passed to elude the bound protein. The thiol group containing compound present in the mobile phase breaks the disulfide bond between the protein and matrix uh, thiol group to release the protein in the mobile phase. So what you have is you have the activated thiol group which is like SSSR and when you are actually adding a protein, so in the protein you actually have the free cysteine, right? So if the free, you have the free cysteine, then it is actually going to react and uh, making a disulfide linkages between the cysteine what is present on the protein with the uh, disulfide linkages and this is the, going to be bound thiol and then when you are adding the reducing equivalence, right, uh, it is actually going to reducing the column and that is how it is the, going to release the protein into the supernatant. For the affinity chromatography, you can actually have the different types of choices. You can have the, uh, the receptor like 5' uh, AMP and that is going to be have an affinity for NAD plus dependent dehydrogenases. 2 prime 5 prime ADP that is NAD plus dependent hydrogenase. You can have avidine which is the biotin containing enzymes. Then you can have the protein A or protein G that is going to have the affinity for an antibodies. The concavalin A which is going to have the affinity for glycoproteins. The protein A which is going to have the poly U messenger RNA. Lysine which is going to have the affinity for ribosomal RNA. Then you can have the sebacrine blue FTGA that is going to be NAD plus dependent dehydrogenases. Then you have lactins that is for the glycoproteins and you have heparin that is for the DNA binding proteins. Now, if you want to do the affinity chromatography, you have the receptor and which is actually going to have the interaction with the ligands. Now, at this stage, the receptor has two options. You have two options. Either the receptor can be uh, you know, tagged with the matrix and then you can actually be able to put the ligand onto the protein, right? And that's how you can be able to use this pair for protein production, protein purifications. Or alternatively, the receptor can be tagged to the protein and the ligand can be put onto the matrix. And in that case, uh, you can actually be also be able to purify the, uh, the, the proteins. So this is all about the affinity chromatography and uh, very briefly we have discussed about how the uh, two ex mutually exclusive parameters can be used to purify the uh, proteins uh, with the help of the affinity chromatography. In our subsequent lecture, we are going to dis discuss about how you can be able to generate the receptor or the ligand and how you can be able to perform the affinity chromatography. So with this, I would like to conclude my lecture here. Uh, thank you.